This is a lecture on uh, Chinese and Japanese art before 1400 uh, for Santa Rosa Junior College students who would like to have this information again just for your edification. Um, and this particular set of slides that we're going to see is just a handful of highlights from the two uh, most influential what were then early Buddhist cultures in Asia. As mentioned with the slide lecture I did on art of South Asia, India, right, and Pakistan, uh, Buddhism's birthplace is India, but there's not that many Buddhists in India now, and the religion spread throughout Asia and found much more of a uh, permanent following in uh, countries in uh, East Asia, China, Southeast Asia, Korea and Japan. So we're going to focus on the two main ones. China, as most people know today, uh, is the, still the most populous country in the world with 1.4 billion people and the same land area that we have, which if you do the math, we have one quarter of the population, so they are four times more crowded, uh, to put it in a nutshell, than we are today. And they were one of the more populous countries, uh, or cultures, I should say, on earth in their early years, which we're going to go back to about 200 20 or so BC, the founding of the first unified Chinese kingdom with our first slide image in just a moment. Um, and at that point, um, they had just a yet, not yet, I should say, begun to convert uh, to Buddhism. Buddhism did make its way into China shortly after that and of course became the dominant religion there and in Japan shortly after that in what we would call uh, ancient times uh, late classical times and then throughout the Middle Ages, Buddhism uh, firmly took root in East Asia, Japan, Korea, <coughs> China, and Southeast Asia. So we're going to see the influence that most of the, the slides today of uh, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist religious beliefs and rituals had on art in both China and Japan. And one more thing, China, I think I've said this to the classes <laughs> that uh, I've always taught um, of this same subject, that China is one of the five oldest urban civilizations on earth, along with India, Babylon, Egypt, and Mesoamerica. So let's see what some of the uh, early and medieval, you know, would be, again, in Western history, we call that late classical into medieval era, uh, crafts and, and art uh, and what, what the meanings of them are. Uh, first for uh, China, we'll do several slides and then segue uh, immediately to Japanese art from the same period. Okay. This uh, whoop, slide is of the Terracotta Army. It's often called of the first emperor of unified China. The correct title of this <coughs> uh, slide is Qin Dynasty Soldiers from Emperor's Tomb, China. Uh, these were terracotta life-size figures, over 8,000 of them, that were carved to represent the army that was to guard the departed soul of the first emperor of China, the Qin Dynasty, that around 220 BC or BCE was the first one to unify northern and southern China under one emperor. So it's often considered the beginning of uh, uh, China as, a, as an empire, as, as a kingdom. There were warring kingdoms in China before that for centuries, actually millennium. Uh, so you could put it on a par with the uh, time of the unification of northern and southern Egypt under uh, Narmer, the first pharaoh to unify northern and southern Egypt, which of course was much earlier. Uh, these figures were lost for thousands of years under a mound of earth where they'd been buried in front of the tomb of Emperor Qin, uh, and no one knew they were there until accidentally one day in the late 1970s some construction workers found these uh, first few of these uh, figures when they were digging for a well and then the government of China 
took over the excavation. They're still excavating this area, and they've put those that they have now uh, unearthed in a giant protected warehouse sort of shed-like structure with, I believe it's a metal roof. In any case, they're protected from the elements and from vandalism, despite what scenes you may have seen in Laura Craft Tomb Raider with Angelina Jolie lopping off some of the heads. Those were obviously fake. Uh, these these don't leave very often. Uh, any of these figures uh, leave, leave China, but a few of them have toured, including to a couple of Bay Area museums uh, oh, eight seven, or ten years ago. Uh, but mostly they stay in China. And they are in an area of China well south of Beijing. is not an ancient city. It's, it's a medieval city. So this was the first capital. They were outside of the palace. The palace is still there, buried under dirt, and has been left intact underneath the ground for reasons that I don't know why. But the, the Chinese government decided not to excavate the palace, but just these figures. There are literally 8,000 soldiers, and no two are alike. It's a remarkable achievement. The details on their facial features, their expressions, even, even their, the details of their uniforms are unique, each figure. And they're roughly six feet tall each. And then there are hundreds of horses and dozens of uh, carts that, of course, would have been towed by the horses to supply the soldiers going into battle. And they're... Um, all in their original position where they've been found and you can see in this slide that there's mounds of hard packed earth between some of the rows of the soldiers uh, but like I uh, was saying many uh, others are undoubtedly maybe even hundreds or more are still uh, waiting to be unearthed uh, and of course you see a few of them are missing their heads and especially in the closest portion in the lower right corner uh, and Kin, by the way, he founded this dynasty, but it was only two generations. It lasted only from him to his son, the second Kin emperor. And then uh, the son was, either, I think when he died, th that kingdom was overthrown, or that dynasty, I mean, was overthrown. And uh, then a new one took over from that point. Um, so these are a UNESCO World Heritage Site, this entire group of soldiers. For formal analysis, what we see is the... Uh, obvious rhythm of their their heads, arms, legs, uniforms, overall similar shapes repeated literally thousands of times. Uh, and the colors, uh, they're actually a cool kind of grayish green. This picture makes some of them look warmer than, than all the photos I've seen, the close-ups of them. Uh, but the actual color is, is cool, somewhere between green and gray of each warrior. Uh, and the horses are also uh, kind of off-white, at least the ones I've seen photos of, maybe they're not all that color. Uh, the textures are superb, as you would imagine. These were the best sculptors in China that carved each of these figures. The carved line is used to create that. So we had a texture of their facial features, their hair, their clothing, and so forth. Same is true of the horses. No two horses are alike in their details. Uh, and then we have um, modeling, of course, is not a technique. These were meant to be buried, literally, to stand guard for eternity over the emperor's uh, you know, body or, or spirit, I should say, in the afterlife. Um, and so, of course, modeling is just now provided by the lighting from the uh, storage shed that they're uh, sheltered in. Uh, and then we have, they're almost entirely stable. They're standing upright as soldiers would do on guard duty. Uh, only a little bit of dynamic detail on the tops of their heads in this, these photos anyway, these images. Uh, and then for mass, well, the soldiers are almost all the same height. So if you break it down by type of figure, the largest mass would be the carts, which you don't see any of them here, or the horses, and those are behind the soldiers, would be the second largest. And the third largest mass would be each individual soldier. Um, and then the, each soldier's pallets is standing upright, obviously, as are the horses and the carts. Um, and uh, if you stood in front of this group, you'd see, you know, roughly right in the middle, uh, even number of soldiers on left and right. So it's balanced both ways, uh, top to bottom and left to right. Um, and for space, we have overlapping of their uniforms uh, and I guess their hair. Uh, most of them are not wearing helmets. I haven't actually seen any. They have top knots, but not helmets on. So I guess you could say there's overlapping on the hair as well over the tops of their heads. And then, of course, the horses, their, their harnesses and saddles and uh, 
uh, the, that overlaps their bodies and the carts um, there are uh, drivers sitting on the carts and you know with horses hitched to the front of them and of course those are all objects that overlap each other but it's all real life-size space this entire complex okay this slide is Tang, T-A-N-G, Tang Dynasty Camel from a Tomb. And the location, of course, is, well, it's not obvious, it's China. And the date is 750 A.D. or, or C.E. Uh, this remarkably beautiful, detailed, lively, and lifelike uh, set of uh, figures uh, on the back of a camel is a classically typical example of the heights that Tang Dynasty art achieved in China. The Tang Dynasty was a period of great prosperity and uh, social contacts or cultural and economic, I should say, contacts with uh, neighboring cultures such as Arab, Persian, and other Asian countries. Uh, there's uh, a well-known right uh, route called the Silk Road that connected China all the way to ultimately to Rome when Rome was at the height of its power there there have been Roman artifacts found in burial mounds <coughs> in China they're over 2,000 years old <coughs> um, but this period we're looking at was the Middle Ages in Europe so most of the Silk Route contacts that went across um, China huge country that it is some of them over through the deserts of eastern China, I meant western, sorry, western China, then over the mountains, uh, Himalayas mostly, and, and, and uh, mountain chains that divide China, of course, from uh, South Asia, and then into either India or on into Persia or the Arab uh, cultures, which at that time was under Muhammad, they, as we discussed with that lecture, expanding rapidly into a major empire, the Arabic empire. And, and was they were wealthy as well too so they would exchange different goods that each culture uh, specialized in and it helped create great prosperity for a large percentage certainly of what we call the educated classes in China at that time not just for the elite and the ruling classes so here we have an image of a, of a bunch of travelers uh, the ones with the beards are uh, from probably the borderline cultures Turkic peoples would be some of them under Chinese rule today in modern China. Uh, and the clean-shaven figures, so there's two of each, are uh, from the Chinese population, the Han people that dominated and still do, I guess, the overall population of, of China. Uh, and so they're together on a um, trading expedition. They could either be going to or returning from exchanging gifts, but looking at the rug they're sitting on there on the back of the camel, it would appear that they've already done an exchange of some of the goods made in China for perhaps a Persian rug. It's certainly one possibility here. Uh, but one of the more interesting details is the lute, or, you know, that's L-U-T-E, not L-O-O-T. Um, an early forerunner of a guitar uh, musical instrument being played by uh, the bearded man who's facing us viewers. Uh, but they're all singing along and what I love about this piece is the personality given to not only the individual uh, merchants or traders, travelers, whatever, that are uh, all playing and singing together, but the camel is joining along with <laughs> the uh, people, the humans. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever been up close and personal with a camel. I can tell you they are nasty beasts. <laughs> they spit, they smell, they kick, they bite. Uh, and I've never wanted to go on a ride for one, uh, on the back of one. But, of course, that was the main mode of transportation at this point in time for these cultures, uh, at least for long distances. Um, camels were, of course, very hardy, and they could cross deserts. So this uh, is a good example of a golden age of art and uh, of economic prosperity in the Tang Dynasty, which lasted, like most Chinese dynasties, for nearly 300 years. And the detail 
uh, of the carved figures, uh, the lifelike quality of their expressions, their, the personalities that come through even on the camel singing along with the uh, humans are all uh, typical of the high quality of Tang Dynasty sculpture at its best, which this is a classic example of. Formal analysis, it's balanced, I would say. Depends on where you draw the line in terms of top to bottom, but if you do it across the middle of the camel's body uh, or somewhere near the top half of that below um, the musicians, I think you can make the case it's roughly balanced. Uh, and left to right, it just depends again. If you draw the line through the top of the standing, the head of the standing uh, traveler, then I think it's balanced again, roughly left to right. For space, it's a real two foot high three-dimensional object in real space but there's clearly overlapping on this it's the only technique for space because the objects are, are proportioned realistically so there's no foreshortening or diminishing size or any of that the figures obviously overlap the back of the camel or overlap the rug they're sitting on the rug overlaps the camel and the clothing overlaps each of the figures um, and then we have the largest mass, easy, the camel, then the rug, and then I guess the, the, the human music, uh, musicians or, or, or traders. Perhaps the man standing seems to be a uh, larger mass because you, you see more of his body. Uh, and then we have color. Well, the camel has a kind of a, a slightly warm uh, earth tone, kind of a, a tan color to it, to, to his body. Uh, and then we see alternating warm and cool colors on the rug and, of course, uh, um, a variety of warm and cool colors on the clothing uh, of the uh, figures on the back of the camel. Um, and then we have the rhythm is obvious. The, the rug creates geometric patterns. The camel's legs create rhythm, uh, his neck hair, and, of course, the human bodies, the heads, hands, and legs of the human figures. It is dynamic on some details, but look carefully, it's more stable than not because the camel standing upright, his neck is close to being straight upright. The standing musician is standing straight upright. The seated musicians, their upper party bodies, their torsos are straight and upright, but their legs, of course, and the musical instrument, uh, the lute, uh, those are dynamic details. There's carved line here to create the simulated textures everywhere. And the modeling is just the light from the museum in which this is found. By the way, speaking of museums, one, finally, museums reopened in the Bay Area. You can find an excellent, superb collection of such figures. Uh, and they range in size from a foot tall to about four feet tall in glass cases at the Asian Art Museum from China and I believe as well as some neighboring cultures that imitated these Chinese sculptures from this period and, and later. Uh, it's an excellent collection that the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, okay, and let's see, I think we've covered everything. Rhythm, balance, mass. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next slide. This next uh, slide is a classic example of a technique for depicting uh, space in a two-dimensional work of art that was invented by the Chinese. We'll give you that definition in a moment. The title is Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. And the artist, we know who it was, was a, a, the, one of the greatest landscape painters of his era in uh, China, Fan Kuan, first name F-A-N, second name K-U-A-N. And the date of this is circa, meaning about 1000 A.D. Uh, this is an example of Chinese three-tier perspective, and the definition of that is a technique for depicting uh, space in a two-dimensional work of art invented by a Chinese landscape painters, in which, number one, the objects in the foreground, that'd be the bottom here, right, appear larger and sharper. The objects in the middle ground, you can see above the rocks and trees, right across the middle, roughly, uh, appear uh, hazier and smokier. Uh, and then the objects in the distance, near the top of this picture, uh, appear sharper uh, but smaller. 
then the objects in the foreground. So putting all three of those segments together in any classic example of Chinese landscape painting which uses this technique of Chinese three-tier perspective you'll see those three different levels or layers as you look further back into the view. You can see that here. This is a mountain with I should have said misty and hazy, not necessarily smoky, that implies human activity or, or forest fire in the center ground uh, of, of the picture. But let's look at the foreground first. The travelers are barely visible. They're down just barely, tiny little figures on the road, for, uh, almost all the way to the uh, right end of the road. Uh, and then there are giant boulders in uh, you know the hillside closest to us, the viewer, which are very sharp and very uh, strong and delineated very clearly and of course larger than the boulders further away which would be you know down below because this is on a crevice looking down on a road below us the viewers and uh, those boulders are smaller and then the, the tr but yet they are sharp and clear as are the trees interspersed among them then you get to the hazy misty section which of course could be due to a waterfall obviously there is a waterfall you see it in the crevice in the uh, rocks or cliffs in the distance uh, it could be causing you know a uh, mist water mist or just fog as often is the case in the mountains um, and that covers oh not even a quarter of the total but it's in the middle section and then above that you see the tops of the boulders as they rise up to some scrub oak or small trees and bushes those are sharply delineated but obviously the objects the trees and the edges of the rocks are smaller than the objects in the foreground so this artist Fan Kuan being the most successful and one of anyway the most famous and successful landscape painters in China at the time is by some historians he's credited with inventing the technique we just described there's no way to be sure of that but he's the first famous artist in, in uh, uh, Chinese landscape art to uh, use this technique consistently. And this is a scroll painting. That's the other important part about it. Scroll paintings are something that Japan, China and Japan both did. But the Chinese are sometimes credited also with inventing that, where you have anywhere from, oh, it could be a, some of them only six feet. I haven't seen any shorter, up to ten maybe feet long paintings on uh, uh, they could be canvas or this one's on silk most of them are on silk or even paper that can be rolled up and moved and then uh, unscrolled right and attached to a wall anywhere you would want them so they're portable portable landscape paintings in essence made of the materials available at the time and it's almost always ink and sometimes other uh, types of painting uh, techniques on the surface of either uh, canvas, uh, silk, or paper. Um, and this is one of those. It's a Chinese scroll painting of a classic landscape in the mountains, which China is full of mountains all over that country. And uh, it uses that technique again. Uh, so for space, let's do the form analysis. Here you do have diminishing size, of course. And I would say foreshortening on some of the boulders, at least in the foreground, and maybe the tops of the cliffs in the distance, too. So diminishing size, overlapping, obviously, the trees and boulders of the background, and diminishing size. And then some people would consider the misty, hazy look in the middle atmospheric perspective, but they didn't think of it that way, so that you wouldn't use that term. It's part of the three-tier perspective. That's the main technique here. There's no scientific perspective used here. And then we have for color, it's a warm kind of a, you know, slightly gold tinted uh, tan color of the ink and the background, the silk itself provides that mostly. But there is, of course, a neutral of the dark black on, especially on the trees on the tops of the mountain, cl the cliffs in the background. The largest mass would be the face of cliff, of the cliffs themselves in the upper half of the painting, and then probably the boulders at the bottom in the nearest part of the foreground, and then of course it would be the other boulders and trees and, uh, on the opposite side of the road in the lower third of the painting. Um, and then we have the rhythm, of course, the repeated shapes of the boulders, <coughs> the trees, um, and uh, the cliffs 
in the distance with their crevices and those are bold outlines so there's a drawn a line here both bold and thin thin on some of the foreground objects especially some of the trees along the road bold on the boulders uh, closest to us and the, the edges of the cliffs in the distance balance yes definitely balanced roughly of course left to right and I would say top to bottom uh, you could make the case since there's a little bit of empty sky at the very top that it's slightly unbalanced toward the bottom uh, and modeling is very strong and realistic as is simulated texture on the boulders and the trees and the cliffs uh, and then of course it is both stable and dynamic it's it's stable in that the uh, cliffs in the distance are upright and even the crevices you know where the waterfall is coming down on the right uh, fa fairly stable but there's a lot of dynamic detail so uh, one could say it's more dynamic uh, <coughs> if you count all of the optics in the bottom third the boulders and trees that have curved lines and the tops of the mountains okay okay this next slide is <coughs> Song Dynasty Guan Wer Vase. Song is S O N G and Guan Wer is G U A N W A R E. Uh, this is from China, 1250 AD or CE. The Song Dynasty followed the Tang Dynasty, and there was more uh, political uh, conflict and uh, upheaval, even some. some fighting you know wars between different parts of the, the Chinese uh, kingdom and uh, there wasn't great you know colla a collapse or anything like that it was still a, a cohesive uh, period in Chinese history but it was less prosperity than the Tang Dynasty and uh, the artwork was more focused on by this time Buddhist influences and principles of uh, balance in all things as Buddha taught as we discussed to some degree with the slides of Buddhist works of art in South Asia one of the main concepts among many in Buddhism is to achieve balance in your life and in society therefore hopefully between different groups of people or individuals so that there's less conflict and more peace and more time to contemplate the meanings of life and uh, to uh, hopefully ultimately achieve enlightenment by the end of your life so this is a uh, ceramic vase to be obvious it's ceramic made in a classical style for the royal household almost certainly for the emperor of China at that time and it is um, only about seven inches tall which is not very large I, I used to think it was much larger than that before I checked uh, but many of them were that tall I, I've seen them in museums some of them these Guan Wei Song era Chinese vases could be up to two feet so they would range from say several inches to up to two feet so this is one of the smaller ones uh, but what's important is the symbolic balance that it exemplifies now how so well let's start with the fact that if you look at the uh, color depending on what your screen shows of the crackle it's called crackles or crackle pattern which started out as an accidental uh, defect in some of the early uh, castings of these or you know moldings of these and firing of them you know from kilns I guess w w would have been unintended but then it became a stylistic uh, detail that was used regularly in song uh, vase artwork Th it's a red dye that somehow works into the surface of the ceramic and causes these lines these uh, various dynamic lines that as you can see work their way up the entire neck and those are red or reddish and so those are warm but the vase itself is a cool off-white into blue well actually more bluish into green color I've seen a white version of this in <laughs> actually Stockstead the last edition the textbook uh, where you can see the red contrasting with the white more clearly but obviously the background the overall color is is this cool bluish light bluish color so you have a contrast 
and a balance, I should say, a balance there between warm and cool colors. There's also gold used on the rims of both the lip and the base. And that gold's rather dull and faded here. It's much brighter in some of the other slides of other vases from this period, but it is nonetheless a warm color. So you have warm and, and cool balancing each other. Then my favorite way of indicating balance or symbolizing the balance that one should achieve in Buddhist philosophy of life is the space covered by the bowl which you'd have to just with your imagination imagine how the bowl rises up to the neck but just if you drew lines into an actual curve like a regular circle from the sides before they actually start at the neck that area of the bowl and the area covered by the whole neck up through the lip are equal in space in closed space it may not look obvious at first, but it's been well uh, documented, and that's the deliberate effect uh, that the designers made of a balance between the bottom and top of the areas covered by this. So that's another uh, aspect of balance. And then we have, of course, the obvious balance from left to right uh, in this uh, figure it's it's totally balanced symmetrically and then finally we have the balance between stable and dynamic elements the rim and the base as well as the neck are almost entirely stable although you could say they're also dynamic because you know they're round but in this view and when you look at it it would be partly stable and then the bowl obviously and the part of the top of the neck where the opening is right near the rim and just below the bowl those are, are dynamic so again, there's a, what, a fourth way in which this is balanced between stable and dynamic elements. So it's symbolic, uh, very subtle and very uh, well, cleverly, I would have to say, um, uh, of the concept of balance in all things that one should try to achieve in their lifetime uh, and in their behavior towards other people that Buddhism taught as a very high value people should try to live by. Okay, so let's do the formal analysis. This is mostly cool, but with a little red uh, crackle and uh, gold uh, trim on the lips and the, or the top of the, the lip and the base. A mixture of cool and warm. We already said how it's balanced. For space, it's real enclosed space, roughly seven inches tall. Uh, I don't think you can break it down into two masses. It's one single mass. We already said it was stable on the neck and the very top and bottom edges uh, or lips and base and then of course dynamic on the bowl and the crackle lines on it. And there is in that case line, the crackle lines, the red lines, but are they drawn? No, not really. <laughs> they're, they're fired, I guess you could say. They're, they're just a side effect of the firing of this piece, but that's visual line at least. There's no modeling. It's the lighting from the museum. Uh, that would create this simulated, uh, sorry, there is no simulated texture, they're just the smooth real texture of um, the ceramic, of course. Um, and let's see, I think that's it. Yeah, all right, so now let's shift our gears to uh, art of Japan and some of the influences of Buddhist philosophy on the art of that culture. This next slide is called the Inner Shrine at Ise, that's capital I-S-E, Japan, circa 100 A.D. or C.E. Uh, first of all, Japan, as many people know, is one of the world's largest economies and in a, a country roughly the same area, land area, as California, uh, there are over three times as many people, 127 or 8 million people. So it's more than three times as crowded as California, despite how many people feel California is crowded. Um, Japan is much more so. Uh, Japan didn't officially embrace Buddhism until around 500 or so AD, what, a thousand years after it was born uh, when Buddha lived in India. But it had already a belief system that was dominant there called Shinto which later was fully integrated or incorporated into Buddhism so most shrines uh, in you know religious sites and, and artifacts 
from what 1500 years ago all the way to today are Shinto Buddhist in Japan uh, but this predates the introduction of Buddhism formally there, there would undoubtedly have been some followers of Buddhism in Japan by this time 100 AD but it wasn't the dominant religion so it's Shinto but not Shinto Buddhist but it's classically Japanese it's a, a small temple in a, a fishing village near the coast of Japan which is rebuilt every 20 years by the village working together and this became symbolic of first the Shinto teachings about the beauty of nature and the simplicity of natural materials you notice how simple this is not ornate or decorated highly as later Buddhist uh, art got to be um, <clears throat> but in early Shinto the emphasis was on natural materials such as the thatched roof and the wooden walls and uh, heavy beams that hold the thatched roof in place across the top of the the crest of the uh, or peak of the gable along the top of the roof line there and of course the logs that support the first level which is a granary and we'll talk about the, the reason for that in a minute um, so natural unadorned uh, mostly unaltered materials are basic to almost all periods of Japanese history going back thousands of years in their um, admiration for natural uh, features and materials from the local environment so this reflects that it was a, an early Shinto temple and only priests and village elders were allowed inside originally but there's a symbolic uh, purpose to the building as well and it is somewhat predictive or forerunner of what later became official teachings or philosophy I should say of Buddhist Japanese Shinto Buddhists which were again that you should have balance or try in human society in culture and relations between individual humans as we've been discussing a uh, thing should be balanced so that there's there's not a lot of conflict or as little as possible and people can have a more peaceful contemplative you know state of mind to help try to achieve enlightenment so even though Shinto predates Buddhism it had a similar concept so how it's exemplified by this building or symbolized by it is that every 20 years the building is taken apart and rebuilt by people uh, from the village now they're supervised by master carpenters who are trained for this purpose every generation or so it's roughly a generation or short generation of 20 year periods the last time this was redone was 2013 so this building you're looking at the photo is from the 1990s or right around the early aughts perhaps uh, and the next time it'll be rebuilt is doing the math 2033 why do they do that it's to teach the concepts of balance in society in culture in their own village and in relations between people for example there are tasks parceled out among the population for almost everyone over the age of toddlers anyway children and adults you know whatever tasks are they're capable of doing older and younger rich and poor even if you're a wealthy landowner on the edge of the town with lots of acreage you'd still be expected to participate in the rebuilding of this along with the poorest farmers men and women uh, and even if someone was uh, you know moderately disabled but they could do a certain task they would be invited to join so it, it involves the spirit of community and cooperation of course and ultimately balance between the different segments of that local population in the process of rebuilding it, it it's really a wonderfully uh, enlightened concept now the granary down below hell grain contributed by every farmer who had any to spare during the harvest season each year so that in the winter if things got difficult you know there was problems with, with, with flooding or, or even droughts which of course do happen in even in Japan uh, or some other individual disaster hit a certain farmer or group of farmers like you know a fire burning down there farmhouse or some other disease or, or personal tragedy and they needed food because they couldn't provide themselves with enough food for them and their family they could have grain parceled out to them according to their need by the village elders from this storehouse on the first floor of this temple another almost proto or pre-buddhist concept of how you know it should be a balance not just you know that doesn't mean 
there they were as Marx would have said Karl Marx you know there shouldn't be any wealthy people and all private property should be abolished that was never a part of Buddhism but the concept of balancing out the needs of the people who had the least and needed the most uh, help uh, from those who had better off conditions uh, that's something you see quite often carried out in ways like this with this granary as part of the temple to help their own people when they need it in times of need. Okay, so that's the overall meaning. Uh, this is a black and white photo, but I've seen color photos. The walls are kind of a light yellow, almost like blonde pine-like color of wood. And that, that plus the definitely yellowish hay, it almost looks like hay color of the uh, thatch roof, which is you know dried grass. Those are, those are warm colors, even though the photo makes it look neutral. It's dynamic on the high peak gables of the roof line itself and some of the cross beams that hold right you can see them sticking straight oh well diagonally up into the sky at either end uh, otherwise everything below the roof line is stable it's all straight lines there's only the modeling from the shadows created by the sun here of course no technique for modeling it's the real smooth texture of uh, sanded or polished wood and it's probably varnished to protect it and then rough real texture of the thatched roof so no simulated textures um, totally balanced left to right and I would argue top to bottom is depending on where you want to draw the line but the uh, balcony around the you know uh, outside of the the second floor projects out almost as far as the eaves of the roof line above it so it's you could say weighted somewhat toward the top because the uh, the the eaves along the gable are slightly wider <coughs> project further out slightly but it's roughly balanced left to right and top to bottom <coughs> the largest mass well probably it's a close call between the roof itself if you count as one mass and then the upper story uh, and you'd have to know the dimensions but anyway that uh, roughly look they almost look equal and then of course the next largest mass would be the granary the ground floor and then the beams across the uh, peak of the roof uh, there is no visual line or carve line here unless you count the edges of the thatched roof where the sunlight makes it look like they're sharp edges there's no carved or painted line here and obviously it's got the rhythm of the beams the eaves the columns supporting the uh, balcony around the granary and so forth uh, and for space it's real space with excuse me two levels uh, only about seven feet high on the granary ceiling and about 15 feet high on the ceiling of the shrine or, or temple space above and then the roof of course projects a few feet above that and that's all real space there are no techniques for space in this piece okay this slide is um, of the Buddhist temple it should say temple compound or, or complex but the title in the textbook is Buddhist temple at Nara and as you may recall Buddhist is spelled B-U-D-D-H-I-S-T temple at Nara that's capital N-A-R-A -A, Japan 607 that would be near the earliest period of or within a century anyway of the introduction of uh, Buddhism into Japanese society so by this time we had the Shinto Buddhist right blending of, of beliefs which which were really compatible already before Buddhism w with Shinto beliefs as we discussed with the last slide so what are we looking at well it's really uh, several buildings of course uh, which are enclosed in an outer walkway covered walkway forming open courtyards it's a retreat in the mountains of Japan uh, for people who wanted to achieve enlightenment and balance in their lives and get away from the <laughs> hurly-burly of uh, early medieval era Japanese cities uh, I don't even think Edo existed that would be the f forerunner of Tokyo the, the name for what's now Tokyo but there were already some cities in any case if you want to get away from you know the distractions of everyday life you would perhaps uh, asked to join this uh, retreat but you were expected to work and help create uh, 
uh, the things that are needed within this community. Uh, you wouldn't just be taking a vacation, you'd be working alongside the other existing residents or monks who were, you know, obviously giving daily lessons in Buddhist teaching. So you would be helping to grow food, to cook it, make your own clothes, repair the buildings, and do, do various other things, tasks, daily tasks, while you live there. So you might stay, you know, a month, or you might stay years, you might even stay the rest of your life, uh, if, if you found it compatible and you did what the uh, Buddhist monks or priests running it felt you were supposed to. You might be able to stay indefinitely. Uh, this has several pagodas, well two main ones. The one that's projecting the tallest structure which is five stories uh, and it has a finial rising up. You can see it against the trees in the distance. Uh, so what is a pagoda? A pagoda is a multi-story house of worship with wide overhanging eaves supported by projecting wooden beams. That's how all traditional pagodas in all over Asia have been all over East Asia uh, practically, you know, in, in Hong Kong, in, in um, Korea, in China proper, in Vietnam, every every one of those countries I've visited, uh, I've been to pagodas, and they all have those features in common, even if they're variations on the details and decorative uh, amount of decorative woodwork on the walls or inside. Uh, they were devoted to almost, well, it's a Buddhist concept of uh, architecture, but here it's the Japanese version of it, which is more simple and, and clean, as we mentioned with the Shinto philosophy, Shinto, I should say, philosophy of natural materials and not disguising them. And we have a dining hall, the building with the widest roof uh, near the back end of the, well, that courtyard is at the far end of it. And then a residence hall, uh, which would be the building uh, which looks somewhat like a, a pagoda and may well be a, a, a dual purpose building, which many of them were, uh, for both religious teachings or, or, or worship and rituals, as well as a residence for the monks. That would be the building on the far, near the middle of the picture on the far right. And then there would have been, you know, workshops and, and various other uh, structures helping to create the food and clothing and other necessities of this self-contained community in the mountains of Japan. There were dozen, well, probably hundreds of such retreats, but this is one of the oldest, and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site protected by the United Nations as well as the government of Japan. It has been rebuilt, parts of it, as recently as the 18th century, the early 1700s, so what, 300 years ago? I think at least part of some of the structures go all the way back to the um, the seventh century, the the six hundreds when it was founded. But most of the structures were, were rebuilt a few hundred years ago, and then re they were restored in the twentieth century. But it's been a continuously functioning uh, Shinto Buddhist retreat for over thirteen centuries, actually fourteen centuries. Formal analysis. Well, the roofs here are covered in tile. You can't see the wooden walls, so the real textures are smooth clay tiles and rough wooden walls. There is some plaster. You might vaguely be able to see it on the back wall of the, uh, or outer wall of the building in back, the dining hall, it probably is. In any case, that building has some smooth, or uh, sorry, I meant rough plaster, rough wood walls, and smooth clay tiles are the main materials. No cement textures visible. Modeling is the shadows underneath the overhanging eaves here and along the walkways, just natural modeling from the sun. There's no line vi uh, visible here, certainly not carved line, but if you got up close you would see carved line uh, underneath the eaves on the beams. They often have animal head designs at the end of each beam, but you can't see them here, so here it would just be the edges of the buildings creating visual lines. The largest mass would be the five-story main pagoda and then probably the dining hall in the far back it, assuming that is still used as a dining hall might not be anymore but probably still is and then it's a close call but probably the third largest mass is the building on the far right uh, with the two stories that probably doubles as a uh, either a pagoda and a residential structure <laughs>
Uh, and then we have for space, well, the tallest structure is the main pagoda with five stories, roughly uh, 15 feet high, including the roof lines each. And then the finial, it reaches a height of a good 100 feet, to the top of the finial anyway. The others are real space, again, two stories on the building on the far right. And it appears to be one large, very high ceiling, one open room for the dining hall in the background. Those are all real spaces. Uh, there's no technique for space. It's dynamic on the roof line, stable on the walls, pretty much, uh, all the way through the whole complex. Uh, each structure is balanced, as they would be in Japanese architecture, each individual section or structure in each section, left to right and top to bottom. Um, and let's see, mass, open space, balance, uh, I think we've covered all the main topics for the formal analysis, okay. This is a wonderful site that uh, I will mention. Some of you can actually see for yourselves if you go on vacation to Hawaii, though it's not in Hawaii. I'll explain in a few minutes. Uh, the title of this is Biodo Inn, and that's not like an inn where you stay, you know, that kind of inn. It's one word, B-Y-O-D-O -O hyphen I-N. But in parentheses, the other name for it, the more popular and common name, is Phoenix, like the city in Arizona, and the bird. Phoenix Hall, P-H-O-E-N-I-X Hall, Japan 1053. So what we have here is a structure that was um, built during, some say the Golden Age, but anyway, one of the high points of Shinto Buddhism. And it had begun to become more ornate in terms of the architectural styles of some of their uh, temples. And of course, that means, and as you see them here, the temples are examples of uh, wooden pagoda architecture common throughout Asia, but especially in Shinto Japanese retreats. But this wasn't originally built as a retreat uh, or as a temple complex, which is what it is today. It was originally built as a residential, secular residential compound for a counselor to the uh, emperor, I believe it was at that point, or the local ruler at least. And then when that counselor died, it was converted into temples, which it has been a functioning, self-contained uh, Shinto Buddhist community ever since, uh, somewhere outside of Kyoto, uh, in a rural, obviously rural setting in Japan. And these wide overhanging eaves even curve upright. And Phoenix, which I think many of you know, but in case you, you, you don't remember, was the mythical bird that rose from the ashes as symbolic of a recovery like San Francisco had after the 1906 quake and our whole economy hopefully will have after this uh, shutdown period we're living through. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're visible. You can see them at the top of the tallest pagodas. Uh, the corners of the of the peak of the roof line they're barely visible you can see them there and that's one reason it was called Phoenix Hall and also the symbolic meaning of the bird that this you know became a way to perhaps for some people reconnect with nature and the value of uh, you know the meaning of life and of course to try and uh, obtain or attain enlightenment through Buddhist teachings the reflecting pool in front of it is an important part of the concept that was designed to have that reflecting quality that creates a very serene contemplative state of mind that of course is important part of the purpose of this site this is also a unesco world heritage site also the pond is stocked with fish which uh, the monks often catch to help create their own meals and they do, just like in that Nara retreat, maintain this site by each one working on different tasks needed to keep the community going as a self-contained Buddhist Shinto compound. However, it's open to the public. You can see there are groups of, it looks like, students here. And there's one other thing I mentioned that you could go see it without going to Japan. There's an exact copy done with brighter, more, uh, let's say, smoother finished woodwork, but nonetheless identical in every detail 
in Hawaii on Oahu, about 20 miles outside of Honolulu. It's a wonderful site. I recommend it. I know most people go to Hawaii. All they care about is the beach. Uh, but really, there's so much else to see in the history of Hawaii. And this is one of them. It was dedicated in 19, I think it was 64, after being, you know, for, for a few years under construction by the government of Japan as a peace offering and get this, an atonement for Pearl Harbor which is very moving and touching if you think about it because of the history of World War II. Both countries suffered mightily but of course the Japanese did attack first and they were acknowledging that and that showed some I think a great enlightenment <laughs> almost that they gave as a gift a, a full-scale replica of this and it can be visited today it's it's wonderful inside the main pagoda is a statue as the original has here and the copy in Hawaii of uh, a, a statue of Buddha which is gilt covered in gold paint seated on a, a giant platform or a large platform of giant um, lotus leaves and uh, that is he's in the lotus position the statue of Buddha he's shown seated which Earlier, remember, uh, images of Buddha were usually shown standing. And uh, the height of the figure of Buddha, seated though he is, is nearly 10 feet. And that's not even counting the decorative detail behind his head and the height of the platform, which forms a kind of a seat made out of lotus leaves. It's it's a absolutely fascinating uh, image. It's in the middle of the main temple that you see here with the tallest roof lines. So it's well worth a visit if you're in Oahu uh, to break away from the beach just for a couple of hours and take a bus. You can get there by bus or a rental car uh, and, and go visit this, uh, the replica of this site. Okay, um, formal analysis. Balanced, oh yeah, each building, it's classic Japanese architecture, is going to have balance left to right and uh, top to bottom. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the repeated overhanging eaves and the the wooden uh, columns supporting it and the roof beams, you can see them here where the light penetrates underneath the overhanging eaves. Those, they get more and more ornate as you get later into Shinto Buddhist architecture. Uh, the largest structure is the main uh, pagoda and of course some people call it a pavilion, that's a general word for any structure that is part of a complex and it's a separate section but you can say either pagoda or pavilion in which, inside of which is the seated statue of Buddha. That's a larger structure, but a close second would be the slightly taller pagoda uh, on the far right of the picture, but it's narrower and, and the eaves don't extend as far. So that'd be the second largest mass, and then the one in this picture on the far left. Uh, the textures are all rough, real textures of wood, real rough plaster between the wood beaming on the walls here, especially visible in the middle structure. The, largest pagoda and then real smooth clay tiles. The roof lines here I have a kind of a th this photo makes them look warm but they're not they're kind of typical of many Buddhist uh, East Asian pagodas greenish or greenish blue color tile that would make those cool but everything else well the walls with the stucco po uh, panels too are cool but everything else the majority of the of the colors here are natural wood and therefore warm. Um, and then we have for space you've got a uh, it's actually a three level pagoda uh, but it's hard to tell from here uh, the main one in the middle um, as you go up some stairs and then there well it, it's two plus because the attic what we would call an attic there is no attic really is up above that and that's another level uh, I think it has walkways but there's no floor there so you can say it's two very tall stories which have heights as you can almost tell from the people here, about 15 feet on the first level and close to 20 on the upper level, if you just call it two stories. And then there's the three-story uh, taller pagoda roof line sticking up on the far right. And uh, those floors are almost all about the same height, about uh, 15 feet. So it reaches a total height of oh, about 50 feet, including the roof line. And that's all real space. There's no techniques for space. Um, the modeling is just the shadows from the sunlight under the eaves here. It's dynamic on the overhanging roof lines. I think I mentioned it's stable on the walls. 
and there's visual line here at the corners, but also formed by the wooden beaming along the walls at least visible, well, actually on all three structures that are in the front of this complex. Um, but there's no visible carved line. Where you to get closer, you'd see, of course, carved line on the beams and on the figures at the corners of the two uh, phoenix uh, birds, of course, are done with wood and carved line is used on those. Um, okay, um, let's see. That's that's uh, everything on this one. Let's go to the next. This next slide is one of the most uh, evocative, I think, and perhaps uh, it, it moving. I would say eloquent of all of the works we're seeing in this particular lecture, at least I have always thought so, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. It's The title is two words, Kuya Preaching, K-U-Y-A, Preaching. We notice the artist's name, it's Kosho, his last name, K-O-S-H-O, and this was circa 1200 A.D. Um, this is an example of a later version of Buddhism that was an outgrowth of Shinto Buddhism in Japan, uh, which spread throughout much of Asia, although actually it star actually started, I should say, it started in Korea and then spread to Japan and then some parts of mainland uh, China, called Pure Land Buddhism. And what that means, we'll give you that definition, is a sect of Buddhism that arose during the Middle Ages, right, we're talking about 1200, a little earlier, about 1100 or so, um, which taught that there is a, quote, pure land or better place to which worshipers who follow the teachings of Buddha faithfully throughout their lives would go after they died, period. Well, that sounds very familiar. It sounds like the Christian concept of heaven, and it is closest of all the Buddhist sects to that idea of an afterlife and a, and a, and a continuing presence, spiritual at least, if not physical, of your soul or spirit after you die. And so it was an easier form of Buddhism for, for many of the people in Japan to, to follow throughout their lives and to be faithful to than the more uh, complex rituals and teachings of the uh, classic esoteric versions of Buddhism that had been taught, you know, for centuries before this. So it caught on, in other words, it, it was a very popular uh, sect within uh, Buddhism, and in essence became its own separate sect, even though it had a lot in common with Shinto Buddhism. So who was Kuya? Kuya was one of the, if not the most important preacher of this philosophy of the idea that if you follow the teachings of Buddha and he would then say, you know, specifically how to do that in villages throughout Japan where he walked all over the uh, I islands, I think it was, you know, the main island, Honshu, but he was known to have gathered people spontaneously in each village he came to uh, by first banging a drum. You see he's holding this is about a, uh, an 18 inch high figure, right, between 18 inches and 2 feet from the platform he's standing on, which almost looks like a book, which could be a, of uh, Buddhist prayers. Uh, and then he's holding a stick, and that's symbolic of the top of it looks like antlers, and that's symbolic of Buddha's famous incident where he uh, shot a deer and watched it die and regretted it and decided to abandon his life of luxury as a prince and go into the wilderness and the rest of his history when he had his epiphany and his moment of enlightenment and decided that he would start this new philosophy or religion uh, which was named after him. We, we covered that with the South Asian slides. So that's symbolic of the roots of Buddhism. The, the drum is just that, a drum, and he has a, a hammer, you know, um, like object, which of course he would beat the drum with and make enough noise to gather people around him. But my favorite detail is the six miniature Buddhas coming out of his mouth on a piece of wire. That's symbolic of chants, Buddha's chants, and there were several Pure Land Buddhism had that uh, the priest of that sect would use to get their followers or worshipers to join them in and if they started saying it together 
these chants with the priest in a large enough group they literally could induce a trance like state of mind and I'm going to tell you something personal here I've been through that because when I was at Berkeley it was a popular uh, movement called Nishrin Shoshu Buddhism that taught the same concept and we had a chant and I'll just do a rather quick uh, imitate or not imitation uh, uh, rendition of it Nam yoro renge kyo, nam yoro renge kyo, over and over, louder and louder. In a room one time at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium with 5,000 seats, the kind of crowd we won't see for years probably ever again. I was in that crowd, and it was the statewide convention of Nishin Shoshu Buddhist followers. And for about a year, I ascribed to that philosophy. And I chanted along with everybody else, and believe me, you got naturally high. By, well, before the end, it was a good 45 minutes or an hour of chanting. <clears throat> and then you're supposed to pray for something you wanted, like a, a new car or entrance to the law school of your choice. <laughs> That's where I parted company with it. That was the um, westernized California, then 1970s corruption of this idea, which never taught that. Of course, you weren't supposed to pray for personal gain in Buddhist teaching. You were supposed to pray for enlightenment. And, 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 and a good life. And so he taught these things, and uh, you can see that in his, uh, you know, Kuya, the preacher's expression of inner contemplative state of mind that we see now on figures of Buddha himself and many other religious iconography of the Buddhist faith. And look at, he's he's got sandals on, he's not barefoot, I used to think he was, but he's not dressed as an upper or even middle class uh, you know, comfortable, let alone well-off or prosperous uh, member of uh, Japanese society. He depended on the kindness of, well, strangers of his followers who he would gather around him to give these different, uh, well, there weren't lectures exactly, sermons, you could say, uh, teachings of Buddhist philosophy to each of the communities he came to, and then they would usually feed him, of course. It's a, a wonderful image. A formal analysis he's balanced yes he's standing upright it's almost entirely stable the only things dynamic are the tops of his walking stick the top of his head and the round uh, drum uh, which I believe is metal I think it might not be it might be a metal frame with uh, animal skin across the middle uh, that's round everything else is pretty stable except for the edges of course of some of his garments the hems uh, but it's mostly stable and of course the platform is totally the largest mass him then the walking stick then the platform and then I guess the drum and the hammer uh, here for space as I said it's about eight, the last time I checked about 18 inches tall uh, between uh, 18 inches and two feet was the height of most of these kinds of figures there were many done of not just of him but other famous influential uh, Pure Land Buddhist preachers <clears throat> and um, so they were usually that range of about a foot and a half or a foot, even the shorter ones, to two feet. So it's real space, but it has obviously overlapping of his clothing over his body, his hand over the um, walking stick, and his feet over the base. It's warm colors. Here it looks like someone had painted it black, but it could be the wood itself. However, it, it seems to have been worn off on his uh, knuckles there and on his neck. So probably that would be most likely the original color of the warm color of the wood. And then the drum is warm and the bass is warm. But uh, he has a dark, almost black-like quality to his clothing and his skin and the walking stick. <coughs> Excuse me, so that would be neutral. The modeling is just the shadows from the lighting of the museum. This is in a museum. Uh, and then we have textures superb on his skin, on the antlers of his walking stick, on the drum, on his clothing, uh, and of course his legs and sandals. All done with carved line. Um, and, and let's see, he's balanced, yeah, as I mentioned before. And I think, yep, that's all the elements for formal analysis. This last slide is Night Attack on Sanjo Palace, S-A-N-J-O Palace, Japan, 1275. This is uh, typical of uh, Japanese, um, well, prints later on, but this is actually a painting, um, which 
illustrates a historic event that actually occurred uh, not that long before this painting was done. Well, it did actually. It was uh, in the 11th century. So actually it's about 200 years after the event. It depicts a period during uh, Japanese history, the warlord era it's often called, in which uh, warlords who ruled different sections of uh, Japan would fight with each other to try and take over each other's land and have their mercenary armies fight sometimes to the death or battle with each other in bloody conflicts like this particular scene. Um, and this is uh, ink and uh, paint colors on paper um, and it's actually at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, one of the most underappreciated museums of art in the United States. Um, and of course, it, it's co sort of like a, a horizontal version of a scroll painting. It could be rolled up, but uh, it's not meant to be displayed, of course, that way. So this has several elements that are classic Japanese painting techniques, or, or printing, print, sorry, and painting techniques that existed for <coughs> hundreds of years, have existed for hundreds of years in Japanese art, which were very influential for artists of the 19th century, first in Europe and then in the U.S., uh, in, in poster art and uh, various other types of artwork, Art Nouveau paintings and so forth. Uh, artists like Van Gogh, who was, remember, not an Impressionist. If you, if you took <laughs> that period of art history, you know, he's a post-Impressionist. And, and um, Toulouse-Lautrec and others were influenced by Japanese-style painting techniques and prints. What were those? Heavy, bold outlines, a... Um, oblique angle that's the main thing the oblique angle here just screams out at you I mean this is not a traditional bird's eye view or a head-on direct view it's an odd right diagonal view and that's classic to almost all Japanese uh, you know scenes events you know history painting they call that in Western art uh, like this one is as well as some of their smaller uh, you know more intimate scenes of landscaping sometimes and certainly people you know uh, in parks and and uh, even inside their homes and then it also has the stylized aspects of depicting things like these flames the flames here of the buildings which this was a palace of a uh, the followers of a recently deceased uh, Japanese emperor and this army that's attacking was about 500 armed soldiers all wearing armor on on horseback with bows and arrows uh, were setting fire to the wooden buildings on the out outer edge or outer courtyard of this compound of their enemy warlord they succeeded in this event by the way in uh, you know burning down most of the buildings and taking over this palace complex but in the war between these two clans, and they were clans of uh, warlords and their followers, uh, it went on for, for many years, over 25 years. In the end, the followers, if you're curious, of the deceased emperor, the ones being attacked here, actually won the war and dominated the other clan at the end of that conflict. It was a, not a good period to be an average citizen in Japanese history because of the instability, upheaval, and even sometimes chaos and certainly uh, suffering and deprivation that would occur in the wake of these these warlord battles. Okay, so there's also the dynamic quality that almost all it's even in the simple small scenes of people in their homes or, or you know uh, walking across uh, garden bridges or something in Japanese prints th there's a dynamic quality partly created by the extreme oblique angle and so you see those things the dark bold outlines we'll talk about the elements of composition in just a minute the stylized uh, technique for, for evoking flames and smoke you know in the upper right part of the painting <coughs> and then the dynamic quality there's there's very little that's stable so let's do a thorough formal analysis now and that is it's balanced oh yes definitely balanced uh, but some people think the flames are a, a larger you know heavier uh, portion of the composition than the walls on the far left and the soldiers that are attacking them 
but I see it as roughly balanced depending on where you draw the line through the smoke and fire if you draw a line down the middle of the actual composition, the whole composition, I think it's roughly balanced. It's definitely dynamic. Uh, the only thing stable are the edges of the walls at the corners of the inner and outer walls that you see here. There is some cement texture. It's limited. It's stylized. It's not very realistic on the flames. We've already covered that. If you look closely, it's just a bunch of lines, right? That taper to a point. They're supposed to evoke flames. And then the roofs of the uh, walls, of the, the especially the outer compound, that form that diagonal V shape on the far right. Uh, those have somewhat implied more so cement textures. Most of the cement textures is reserved for the horses and the soldiers in their armor. And that's all created with bold and thin outline, of course. The colors are warm on the fire and the roofs of the inner and outer courtyards. Mostly cool, well, a mixture of cool with some you know, warm oranges and reds on some details of the soldiers, but most of the uh, the horses and the armor and the actual, you know, features of the faces of the warriors that are attacking and the walls of the inner compound are cool gray or off, off white. So it's a mixture of cool and warm. Here for overlap, for a space we have overlapping, I don't see diminishing size and I don't see foreshortening, not really. It just appears to have overlapping as the only technique. It's definitely not got scientific perspective or atmospheric perspective. And then we have um, <clears throat> the largest mass would be the flames. And then the uh, walls of the outer uh, compound or outer walls of the, the outer courtyard and then the walls of the inner courtyard that are being attacked here. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the horses and the soldiers and uh, there's modeling and the flames and there's modeling uh, around the flames and of course on some of the horses not all of them some of them don't have much but mo actually majority of the horses and, and some of the human figures have modeling um, let's see I think that's that's about it okay well thank you for joining this lecture hope you enjoyed